Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video on a channel called The State of Daniel, in which he tries to explain why atheists are wrong about faith. Let's hope he doesn't just equivocate faith and trust, as is so often the case, and actually give some good, thought-provoking insight into the matter. I have my doubts, but we'll see! Hey YouTube! Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sick of atheists diminishing Christian intellect. Yeah, that can get annoying. I get it. Christians can be smart. Intelligence does not necessarily correlate with religious beliefs. Now, in my opinion, the religious beliefs represent an area of improperly examined biases, but I'm also honest enough to admit that I don't know with any amount of certainty what goes on inside a believer's head until they tell me what's going on there. And also worth pointing out is that everyone has areas in their life where they have improperly examined biases. I can't tell you how many times I've made a video that primarily focuses on something like young earth creationism, but tangentially touches on something like climate change, and then I get a barrage of atheists commenters bemoaning how I'm usually good and rational when it comes to dealing with religious stuff, but clearly I give up all rationality when it comes to climate science. Too bad I fell into that cult. Climate change has at least as much evidence backing it up as evolution does, and yet these same people who will laugh at creationists for accepting young earth creationism will deny climate science with a vigor that at least equals that of the creationists denying evolution. So what it all comes down to is the fact that critically examining our biases and regularly engaging in metacognition, that is thinking about thinking and how you arrive at your conclusions, is important for everyone. And sometimes, when you engage in such activity, your worldview changes. But because human brains work the way they do, some people can be really good at pointing out other people's biases while simultaneously just not even being aware of their own. All this to say, intelligent people can have wrong beliefs about things, even obviously wrong beliefs, all while still being intelligent people. There's this notion that atheism and science rely on evidence, whereas religion relies on blind faith. Well, take out the atheism from that statement, and you're pretty much right. Now, personally, I believe that the evidence does point to atheism being more likely than the existence of a god in general, but I am perfectly willing to accept the fact that there are a lot of atheists out there who did not reach their atheism through anything approaching an examination of evidence. Atheism is not monolithic. You have atheists who disbelieve for good reason, and you have atheists who disbelieve for bad reasons. You can't paint them all with the same brush. Two things are wrong about that assertion. Number one, there's an incredible amount of evidence behind any major religion, particularly Christianity. Obviously I disagree, but I am very curious about why you would claim that there is evidence behind every major religion. Would you agree that there's evidence behind Scientology? That's a pretty major religion. And why not the minor religions? I imagine the reason that you'd say there's evidence backing up the major ones is because any evidence for the general concept of a god can be applied to any religion that has a concept of a god. But that is basically all religions except for a select few, at least one of which is one of the major religions, that is Buddhism, well, some sects of it. So I can't think of anything that would count as evidence for all major religions, and the evidence that is supposed to point directly to Christianity is often on equal footing and of equal quality with evidence that would point to at least one non-Christian religion. Number two, science has required, requires, and will require faith. Not really. There are a few axioms that science needs in order to operate, but science actively tries to minimize its reliance on axioms, instead opting for things that can be tested and falsified. The basic axioms that science relies on are axioms for everybody, not just science. An axiom is essentially just something that is self-evidently true, something that appears to be true and apparently is true, but doesn't really have any evidence backing it up. One axiom that science relies on, for instance, is that reality is real. None of us can actually demonstrate to anyone else that our reality is actually real. We can test reality to a certain degree, but we can't be sure that it isn't some artificial construct like the Matrix or something. Everyone relies on this axiom, which remains an axiom for everyone, no matter how much a presuppositionalist will insist that God revealed the fact that reality is real to them in a way such that they cannot be mistaken. 
So, in the sense that nobody can adequately demonstrate the existence of reality outside of their own perception of it, yes, science requires an acceptance without evidence for that sort of thing, as does religion. But that really is as far as you can take it, unless you start redefining faith to just essentially mean trust based on previous experience, which is not how religious faith is usually described, except in those equivocation conversations. Usually in the religious sense, the faith is supposed to come first. If you have faith in Jesus and ask him to reveal himself to you, then and only then will he actually reveal himself. No previous experience, blind faith while hoping for a future experience. Many advances made in science happened because some of the greatest minds in history employed faith to pursue those frontiers. So faith is an hypothesis? I think this idea is an accurate description of reality, so I will set out to test it in order to see if I am right by setting up a series of scenarios where any one of them can prove me wrong. Is faith now? I mean, I guess you can say that hypotheses start from a faith-based position if you like, but part of a good scientific hypothesis is including criteria that will falsify the hypothesis. An unjustifiable hypothesis is scientifically useless, and that's the key difference here. Now. Granting a scientific hypothesis the same status as faith in a future experience with Jesus is more than a bit of a stretch, but if I do grant that these are equal starting positions, then the falsifiability of the hypothesis makes it a vastly superior method of figuring out what really is true. If you can't tell me what exactly would prove that an alleged experience with Jesus was not actually an experience with Jesus, then any old mundane experience will do and nobody can prove it wasn't Jesus. Case in point, in my video from last Friday, the apologist presenting the 100 arguments for God was converted to Christianity because he saw two meteors in the same night. For reference, thousands of meteors hit the atmosphere every day, even when the Earth isn't passing through one of the regular meteor showers. And when talking about it, I fully admitted that because I haven't experienced his experiences myself, I cannot say with any certainty that there wasn't something supernatural about the event. I can only point out that, externally, there is nothing interesting about it at all, and everything he said could be adequately explained by coincidence, especially when combined with the fact that we humans have a tendency to not really look at the sky all that often, which is why Venus is so frequently mistaken for a UFO. Also worth mentioning is that hypotheses are direct responses to problems with observed data. Our current understanding of science doesn't account for X in the data. My hypothesis does account for X, so let us test the hypothesis to see if this is potentially the correct way to account for X. So it's not like scientists are just sitting around trying to figure out novel ways to make scientific breakthroughs and only research once they figure out what they want to do. Hypotheses are formulated to solve specific problems in testable ways. Is there anything even remotely equivalent to that for religion? Furthermore, science requires faith because assumptions are made all the time, and they're usually assumptions that scientists can't prove. Yeah, there are a few assumptions that underlie the scientific method, and really these assumptions are there for everybody just living their day-to-day -day lives as well. We have yet to develop a method for testing these basic assumptions, but they appear to be true, so there is no use in assuming that they are false. Should we ever develop a method for testing them, we absolutely will. Until such a time as that method is developed, there's really no point in pretending they are false. For instance, we assume that we can generalize future laws based on past laws. But what would happen if we woke up tomorrow and gravity wasn't working or the Earth suddenly reversed orbit? Then we would adjust our view of the universe to accommodate this new reality. But so far, things like that don't seem to happen and we have no reason to expect them to start happening. Science would be screwed if the laws of physics were suddenly different. No, we'd just have to work out their new method of operation. Yeah, that would change a lot, it would completely mess up our current understanding, but as scientific knowledge is descriptive in nature, the descriptions would change to accommodate this change in what is being described. No faith required. And what if the laws of physics are different in different galaxies? We have no reason to think that the laws of physics would be different in different locations in the universe. It certainly hasn't been conclusively ruled out, but there is no evidence that I am aware of that suggests that different laws of physics are in operation in different areas of the universe, and all of our observations thus far are consistent with the laws of physics that operate in our location. In fact, the observations of distant stars and galaxies have helped us develop some of our scientific laws and theories. So so at least those aspects would almost have to operate in a constant manner both here and in the other galaxies. 
If so, who's to say that they one day won't change in ours? No one. We cannot say for certain that the laws of physics will all be the same tomorrow as they are today, but thus far they do seem to be constant, and so until such a time as they cease to be constant, we will continue to consider them so. And should they one day cease to be constant, we will then change our views to accommodate this new inconsistency. The reality is that there's a lot that science doesn't know and can't answer, even beyond the argument of creation. And most of the stuff that science doesn't know and can't answer is not anything that would be considered within the realm of science. That which remains in the scientific realm are things like your hypothetical galaxies with different physical laws. Until we are able to actually travel to a different galaxy, this will remain mostly unanswerable, though it is a question that would ultimately fall to science to answer. For example, science can't tell you the difference between good and evil. Well, that depends entirely on how broadly you want to define science. Some people would consider philosophy to be a scientific branch, and that is most definitely a philosophical question. But some people do not consider philosophy to be a science, because ultimately science can at least arrive at conclusions about how things do not work. Interestingly, it's pretty much impossible to prove a hypothesis right. It's usually that the hypothesis becomes the accepted explanation if it fails to be proven wrong long enough. But this isn't how all sciences operate. The social sciences are much more nuanced than the so-called hard sciences. It is way more complicated trying to figure out why people behave in a certain way under certain circumstances than it is to figure out why a ball falls down when you drop it. And to be fair, we still don't have a great understanding of how gravity works, but at least with gravity you can isolate your variables and describe it with a mathematical formula. Oh, gravity works. The closest you can get to that with social sciences is statistical trends. And of course I would be remiss if I didn't mention that moral psychology is a real field of research. So while science might not be able to dictate what is right and wrong per se, it can be useful to have a scientific understanding of certain aspects of society while coming up with a moral framework. Science can't tell us that rape is wrong. Uh, no, but science can determine that there are severe detrimental effects of rape on the victim, and these can include lasting and crippling mental illnesses like PTSD in addition to the immediate physical damage. But science alone can't make a value judgment on it. That falls to us. And our value judgments end up being emotional appeals in one way or another, and while there are several methods of arriving at the same moral conclusions, these are not, strictly speaking, scientific methods. They can be philosophical, rational, irrational, pragmatic, doctrinal, and probably a few others that I'm not even thinking of at the moment. But personally, I like to use the methods that are at least partially scientifically informed. Rape causes harm. I don't want people to cause me harm. I have empathy and so am capable of considering the harm done from the victim's perspective, and so I can agree that causing harm is wrong, thus rape is wrong. It's a combination of science, philosophy, and emotion. Sure, we accept that as a value judgment, but science can only tell us what's observable and testable. And the fact that rape causes harm is observable and testable. And even then, a degree of faith and assumption making is required. Not really. Only in the most basic sense that any knowledge about reality also requires. That's what pisses me off, because atheists basically claim that believing in a flying spaghetti monster is as ridiculous as believing in Jesus, because both require faith. Is this why you had that caveat at the beginning about there being evidence for all the major religions? So you could get your jab in at this minor religion that pisses you off without first admitting that there is evidence for it? Anyway, in my experience, the flying spaghetti monster is usually invoked not as some sort of gotcha to say that believing in Jesus is just as ridiculous as believing in a flying spaghetti monster, but rather as a response to apologists asking people to prove that God does not exist, or to give evidence that God does not exist. It is a device that is used to make it easy to see why the burden of proof is a thing, and why it is on the person that is making the claim. Are there people who compare the flying spaghetti monster to Jesus? Probably. But really, is that that bad of a comparison? You believe that God came down to Earth in human form 2,000 years ago so that he could commit suicide by cop in order to be able to forgive sins by way of a human sacrifice with ritualistic cannibalism. And your evidence for that is a handful of books, none contemporary to the events that they portray, that contain nothing special or remarkable in the way of evidence. Why is believing that the creator of the universe is a flying spaghetti monster more ridiculous than that? I can at least demonstrate that spaghetti exists. I'm having it for dinner tonight, in fact. But while this is an apt comparison, it is by no means the purpose of the flying spaghetti monster comparison. That's usually just about burden of proof. 
Let's take a look at some YouTubers. People is asking me to prove to them that there's no God, which is an impossible thing to ask for somebody to do because it's impossible to disprove a negative. No, I don't think I could prove to you that God doesn't exist just like I couldn't prove to you there's a flying pink unicorn in this room right now. Yeah, I mean, there are some circumstances where it is possible to prove a negative, but that does boil down to the fact that apologists often want atheists to falsify their God hypothesis, but then refuse to put forth any criteria that would actually falsify the hypothesis, making it unfalsifiable and thereby untestable. I can't prove to you that there's no fairies. I can't prove to you that there's not a flying spaghetti monster. It's like I couldn't prove there's a flying spaghetti monster out there. It's interesting that he chooses clips here that make the exact point that I am making. It's not about whether believing in the flying spaghetti monster is more or less ridiculous than believing in Jesus. It's that you can't prove that there is not a flying spaghetti monster, just like I can't prove that there is not a god, because they are both unfalsifiable claims. The flying spaghetti monster. Unlike the flying spaghetti monster, there's incredible historic evidence that backs Christianity. Not really. The Gospels represent two and a half sources if I'm generous and include the Q hypothesis, with the two sources being Mark and John, and Q being the half. None of them are eyewitness accounts. None of them even claims to be an eyewitness account. One flat out admits that it's a compilation of other stories. This isn't great historical evidence that the events really happened. There are more available manuscripts of scripture than there are other historic and ancient texts that atheists have no problem believing. That's not entirely true. I mean, I guess it kinda is because there are literally thousands of manuscripts, but as I've pointed out before, no two manuscripts are identical, meaning that this plethora of manuscripts actually makes it harder to figure out what the original document said. We may have thousands of manuscripts, but we have hundreds of thousands of variations between manuscripts. But here's the thing, how many manuscripts there are of a book have no bearing on the truth of the content of that book. So yes, we do accept historical events from historical manuscripts for which we didn't have monks over a thousand years later copying them out in giant scriptoriums to produce thousands of manuscripts that we have today. But we also tend to disbelieve the portions of those books that depict supernatural events. And we also prefer to have multiple accounts written from multiple perspectives. And we don't pick an account and then insist that this account must be 100% true as written. Often, reconstructing historical events becomes a very arduous task, with historians constantly trying to suss out fact from embellishment and sometimes outright lies. My point is that atheists are hypocritical and really dumb when they mock faith because faith is needed in science as well. Weren't you complaining earlier in this very video about atheists insulting the intelligence of Christians? Hypocrite much? But those are just my thoughts and I'd love to hear yours in the comments below. Or in a response video. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Hokitermix, who says the wing of the butterfly is actually monochrome, acting like a prism. This is not entirely accurate, but it is an interesting topic, so I decided to bring it up. Butterflies use pigments, just like other animals. In fact, the brown and yellow ones use melanin, the same pigment that gives human skin its color. But there are some butterflies who get their colors from refraction, referred to as structural color. These are often the blue and purple butterflies. You can tell because they are the iridescent ones. If the color shimmers as it moves, that's a good indicator that the color is coming from structure, as the perceived color will shift slightly depending on your viewing angle. Pigmented color just pretty much stays the same color regardless of viewing angle. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the faith that is required by the atheism that is my channel. If you'd like to be defined as trust based on previous experience, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.